I've had patients that were enrolled in programs like Overeaters Anonymous, <laughs> um, you know, these food addiction models. Um, and once they started doing a treatment for their metabolic system that targeted the actual cause of the behavior, it, it went away. You know, it completely went away quickly. This is Fat Science, a podcast dedicated to the science of why we get fat. No diets, no agendas, just science that makes you feel better. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to replace professional medical advice. I'm Dr. Emily Cooper. I've been treating patients with metabolic issues for over 25 years. I'm on a mission to raise awareness about metabolic dysfunction and why diets don't work. Hi, I'm Andrea Taylor. I've been fat, very fat, chubby, morbidly obese, and done almost every diet ever invented. They all worked until they didn't. I've known Dr. Cooper forever, but when I became her patient and we learned metabolism was the real problem, wow, everything changed, and I've never been healthier. And I'm Mark Wright. It's time for Fat Science. Wait, does this podcast make me look fat? Welcome to Fat Science. I'm Mark Wright, along with Andrea Taylor and Dr. Emily Cooper. It's great to see you, hey too. there. Hello. All right. On the show this week, food addiction, fact or fiction? This is an interesting topic because we were just talking that Andrea has, well, let's just be honest. Andrea knows people who are addicted to chocolate. We will not name names. But nope. on a more serious note, there is probably a, a vein of thought that food addiction is a real thing, just like other addictions that people deal with in their lives. And so what we're going to talk about today is whether there's any scientific basis for the assertion that you can be addicted to food, which is kind of a slippery slope, Dr. It Cooper, is. because we all have to eat to stay alive. It's not like we all have to have beer to survive right. or or other drugs, but th this, is a, this is an interesting debated uh, topic. So I would love to know just some thoughts off the top of your head. As a doctor, as, as someone who's studied science for your whole life, give us some ideas. <laughs> well, yeah, there are different schools of thought around this. So what my personal perspective is might not represent another person in the scientific community, and I'm well aware of that. But um, from my perspective, I think a lot of things have been labeled as food addiction or, quote, binge eating disorder, um, you know, focusing really on the behavior that people are seeing in a, in a person, um, a person who is seeming to be out of control with their eating, um, gravitating to certain foods that they just cannot resist um, over and over and over and over again. And these have been labeled as food addiction or binge eating. But my question is, you're focusing, when you talk about people in that way, we're focusing on their behavior. And there's very little discussion about what could biochemically, physiologically be driving the behavior behind the scenes. And that's my area of focus is more the physiology side. So I tend to tell people, don't worry about it. I mean, I know it's different, but I, they get so anxious that they feel like they can't control their eating. You know, some, some people do feel like I've got, they'll come in and say, I am addicted to this food or I've got binge disorder. And I try to tell them, let's not worry about the behavior. Let's try to focus on what is the cause of that behavior. And if there's a physiologic reason, like it's a symptom, it's just, a, it's a symptom of an underlying physiologic um, imbalance, most likely. And Andrea spent most of her career as a, as a marketing expert. And I'm just thinking about those commercials, Andrea, that say no one can eat just one. What? Oh, because <laughs> you can't just eat just one because it's delicious. I mean... I think that's part of some things too. It's like, you know, sometimes something really is delicious and you want it. And you can, I mean, there's certain things that you can play on. I mean, who can walk by a Cinnabon in the airport? I mean, come on. Yeah. So 
but is that that's not an addiction. That's just something that is behavioral. I mean, yeah, that's like you love the smell of something. You go toward it. That's like a Pavlov thing, I think. Yeah. You know, Probably normal I mean, biology. That's, like, that's just normal. That's just being normal, I think. But, but what, I, um, what I'd like to know, Dr. Cooper, though, is that let's say high, high fat, high sugar, high salt foods, do they hit the pleasure center of our brain when we eat them? Or what's the physiology of food as it relates to what our brain does? Yeah. I mean, I think they, they do most likely those are called highly palatable foods and those can be very attractive. And also the food industry has kind of played on this and done some kind of testing and chemical alterations to try to create more desire towards certain foods and people. But my point is that if you have normal metabolic function, you might really want that ice cream cone and eat it, but you're not, you're going to be satisfied after that. You're not going to then want another ice cream cone and another ice cream cone. Um, so there's just a difference between being gravitating towards a higher fat, higher sugar meal and someone who is constantly gravitating towards that or cannot satisfy their cravings in spite of eating these foods. And that's a clue that there may be an underlying metabolic imbalance that's driving that behavior. All right. Well, speaking of cravings, what is it like that whole thing about a pregnancy craving, which I mean, you hear about it all the time, like when people are pregnant and, you know, there is the pickles and ice cream or whatever that is supposed to be. You know, I think that's just like a salty and sweet thing. But is that a real thing? Is that a behavioral thing? Is that just like, I love pickles? What's the deal there? Well, food cravings are amazing. I mean, they actually can be very reliable for driving a person toward food that they actually need to satisfy a nutritional deficit or a nutritional requirement. So I always like to have people trust those cravings because you never know what that's satisfying in the body. They, they can be extremely accurate and people can crave foods they've never even had before because through epigenetics, we kind of know we have a, some kind of a genetic memory going back to you know, our ancestry that ate certain foods that we may not have ever been exposed to yet. And we still may crave those foods. So food cravings are a good thing. And I think, you know, listening to those is important, but if you start noticing, wait a minute, I'm craving sugar constantly, <laughs> that's something is, is off. And so the first thing I always recommend looking at is what's your eating pattern? Are you skipping meals? Are you cutting out carbs? Because those are the most common causes of craving sugar, basically, is just that you're running on empty and you need to satisfy that. And sugar is a quick fuel that could quickly get your blood sugar levels, your glucose levels up. And so if you've skipped breakfast or it's been like four hours since you ate or you're on a very irregular eating pattern or you haven't been, um, you've been putting yourself on a low carb diet, you're going to crave sugar that's pretty normal. Um, so I think putting it in context of what the situation is when you're having these cravings and is there a logical reason why, um, something that maybe you're, you're not doing with your regular daily consistent nutrition. Hmm. Well, that's really interesting because it's funny, like a lot of my friends who are on like Ozempic or Manjaro, like we tend to want sugary things way more than salty things. Yeah. And maybe that's because we eat a little less than we did before. So maybe that's why we want the, sh we tend to go toward a sugary thing than a salty thing. <laughs> well, that could be the answer. I, mean, I don't know. I don't, or maybe it's because we like, we like the sugary things. Better. I don't know. I think you could, <laughs> it, there's like, you know, a lot of, uh, variation among patients. I have patients that tell me they're craving weird things like oranges or gaspacho even is <laughs> another really? one I heard recently. I wish I gazpacho. Yeah. So not, yeah, it's not always the same for everyone, but I do think anyone who's maybe under fueling 
is going to have a little bit more sugar cravings. Um, or if you have hypoglycemia, the low blood sugar type problem, um, and not caused by those medications, but just hypoglycemia in general, tendency to have low blood sugar reactions, you'll crave sugar also in that situation. But I mean, I think the thing to think about is find out why. Like, is this really an addiction? Addiction implies that it's a, you know, a substance use disorder. We're, we're misusing food as a substance, as Mark said, for like activating our pleasure centers and stuff like that. Could that happen? I guess, but it would be very hard to happen in someone who has a completely normal metabolism because food is just not appealing after a while, after you've satisfied the basic needs, then, you know, the normal thing is your brain senses that satiety and is no longer interested in food. And so it would be kind of hard to break through that. But for people who have metabolic dysfunction, oftentimes the brain is not even sensing the food that we're eating. And so it becomes easier and easier to just consume more without really sensing it, without noticing until your stomach feels like, whoa, what did I do? Um, and that's just right. not normal. That's a sign. That's a symptom of a, a metabolic issue. But I, I think too often the emotional state is blamed for um, these food patterns where often you'll hear that, oh, when you're stress eating. But so many people, when they're stressed, it's not that they're going to go and eat that much, you know? So why would one person who's stressed be gravitating to consuming a lot of high sugar or whatever food that they think they're addicted to when another person under stress isn't doing that? So I'm just asking people to examine more closely the metabolic picture of what could be going on. And that's done through like looking at lab work, understanding your genetics, and if you have a predisposition for certain conditions like diabetes that could set you up, um, there can be even specific genetic problems where there are glitches in the brain pathway that um, cause the inability to actually feel satiated. And it can lead to something called hyperphagia, which is just a constant, really strong drive to eat, like to where you cannot resist it. Um, and this is a, you know, this is a medical condition based on a definite metabolic glitch that is causing a break in the communication pathway in the brain. So that's not an addiction. That's an actual medical physiologic condition, not a psychological. Dr. Cooper, when people come to you with metabolic dysfunction uh, and they may have a background of drug or alcohol addiction, does that change how you treat them in terms of the metabolic loop that's in their body? Is that loop different than a person who maybe isn't uh, dealing with that? You know, you can find some overlap, which is really interesting because there's a portion of the brain pathway, it's called the POMC pathway, P-O-M-C, um, where we manufacture our own drugs basically <laughs> to make us feel good, huh. like our own opiates, like endorphins. Um, and it's amphetamine, like a, kind of an amphetamine like uh, type of picture too, serotonin. There's a lot of chemistry that goes on surrounding that pathway. And so if people have glitches in their metabolism that obstructs that pathway in a certain way, it can lead to cravings for potentially alcohol or opiates or amphetamines. <laughs> uh, so I have found that there is some overlap in some people with that history and that targeting that area of the metabolic pathway seems to be, in, in many cases, really effective, um, both at reducing the maybe alcohol cravings and also improving the overall metabolic function and appetite regulation. So there is some shared uh, chemistry between those two areas. Hmm. Yeah. It, did, haven't they said that some people who were taking like drugs like Ozempic and stuff help them with like not wanting alcohol and stuff like that too? Yeah. I mean, I think I've heard- Like that they've had some success with some of I've that? I've heard some anecdotal reports. I don't think there's any- I don't think yeah, they've done I, scientific I, stuff right. yet. I think it's all anecdotal. I think so. 
I mean, I've had patients that were enrolled in programs like Overeaters Anonymous, <laughs> um, you know, these food addiction models. Um, and once they started doing a treatment for their metabolic system that targeted the actual cause of the behavior, it, it went away. You know, it completely went away quickly. And so then they turned to me and said, well, how could something I've been battling with for a decade and going to these meetings and all of this all of a sudden go away? And it really kind of rocked their world because they had an identity in this, that they were a, had right. were an addict basically to food when it, it really, and you know, you have to tell them, well, if it truly was an addiction, do you think that just taking a medication for a matter of weeks is going to reverse you know, a decades long addiction, you know, a psychological thing. No, it's um, hitting a biological imbalance and improving that to the point where your metabolism works and the sensing throughout the brain pathways restored, your glucose regulations restored. So of course, you're not going to be able to eat the things that you thought you were addicted to like that anymore. And, and it's kind of like a grieving process for patients when they find themselves like that, if they've really identified as a person with a food addiction, and then it turns out it's a biological thing. Um, so I find that really interesting. Oh, they have to switch meetings. <laughs> they have to go to a different meeting. They got to go to yoga now. <laughs> well, I think it's also part of the weight stigma to label people with higher weight as emotional or that it's, uh, you know, they're out of control mm. and it's their emotions that are driving these behaviors. And it, I don't like the, the picture of that either. Um, I think it's not in any other medical condition. You wouldn't just automatically say you're having emotional eating, like you're having emotional you're having pain, emotional cancer. Emotional can you can't, yeah. you can't have emotional cancer. <laughs> right. And so, but we're so quick to, to blaming emotions and stress, you know, um, instead of looking at hard science and objective measurements. So Dr. Cooper, you've talked with some of your colleagues, your contemporaries in the medical community about this. I, I'd be curious to know what they think. Oh, it's been really a challenge. Um, especially over the years, but I can recall many, many conversations where I tried to kind of explore the idea of a biologic cause versus this stress model, emotional model, or addiction model of um, eating patterns and, you know, met, met up with quite a bit of resistance. And um, for example, I remember having a conversation with a dietitian and a bariatric surgeon at the same time, you know, we we're having a meeting and they were reporting to me these things that they had observed in their patient population that kind of conveyed a sense of desperation, you know, be, feeling desperate to eat in some patients, de so desperate that maybe pulling things out of the garbage or eating food that wasn't totally defrosted after, you know, trying to heat it up, not being able to wait for it to, to defrost. And so I would say, well, did you look at any lab work? You know, what's, did you look to see what's going on with the labs? No, no labs. Oh no, you know, no, it's like such emotional eating or it's this addiction. And it really was disturbing to me because those are clear signs of a metabolic disorder. And I don't feel like patients really do um, have benefit from, you know, a full evaluation if they're in that situation, because it doesn't feel good to be in a situation where you really do feel that desperate need to eat that food like as fast as you can. And, um, to be told that that's an addiction or an emotional problem that you're going to solve it by through therapy or <laughs> meetings or something is just so inaccurate because there, it would be hard to believe that that is not due to a biochemical physiologic, you know, malfunction that can be t detected through a full metabolic workup and that can be treated and um, that can turn around and that poor person can feel 
just a total difference in their sense of control and their sense of, of, um, anxiety. So, so that, that has been an issue over the years. I'm hoping that it gets better among the healthcare providers and practitioners and dietitians and, you know, all the people that deal with patients that are, are going through this. And I hope less of them are purely treated with an emotional treatment, um, versus the biochemical analysis that needs to happen. There's nothing wrong with having, you know, therapy or emotional treatments, but it shouldn't be that they're singled out for that treatment because of um, their eating patterns or their body weight or something like that, because it needs to be determined, you know, what is driving that biochemically. Before yeah. I had, before I had my, my, what did I have? The sleeve, the gastro sleeve or whatever it's called. Um, there was no metabolic workup there, but they did ask me a lot about like, did I ever eat out of the garbage or anything like that? Or was I ever so desperate for food? And they did make me have a psychological um, workup. Like I had to talk to some shrink or something. To, and they asked me, do I think my life would change totally from the surgery? I was like, no. <laughs> um, that, that was a big thing. that They asked a lot of questions about that. Like, would my life totally change? And... Um, but they didn't do any, I told them, because I work with you, um, I told them my metabolic yeah, workup. Right. Um, and my surgeon was like, oh, this is so fascinating, so interesting. Yeah, it's like so, the surgeons yeah. have said to me, well, we don't know why some people, you know, do well after surgery and some people don't. And again, I would say, well, have you done like pre-op labs to look at what's really driving the metabolic disorder? No. no, no, they didn't do any. Yeah. I told them what, what it was. Uh -huh. And then we figured out afterwards, well, it didn't do exactly what we thought it might do. And then I went back on the medication and then together between the surgery and my medication cocktail, things worked out. But I mean, it was very interesting to me. And then, you know, the diet, Titian's advice was awful. And, you know, they basically wanted me to eat plastic cheese and, um, you know, like a 500 calorie a day diet. It's hard to wow. change the thinking. The old thinking is very hard to change, but there is some hope that as we talk more and more about, um, you know, appetite dysregulation and metabolic dysfunction leading to obesity and diabetes, as we talk more in those, that language, Hopefully people will start kind of discussing more about the hormones involved, the insulin levels, the ghrelin levels, the leptin levels. Right. I think, yeah, I think they knew some of that stuff and why it worked, but it all seemed sort of like miraculous to them. <laughs> Andrea, did you have the bariatric surgery before seeing Dr. Cooper? No, after, because okay. we thought it might help kick in with some... Uh stuff, but it sort of, we thought I could go off of some of my medications if I did it, but my, um, my metabolic issue is too strong. <laughs> my, um, yeah. my problem and my issues are too, what do we say? Yeah, I mean, my, I'm, it's too messed up. <laughs> no, we didn't say that. No, but it, I mean, it did help. Um, combining it did. Help. Yeah, there are patients where um, combining the medical and surgical yeah. treatment together has more impact than yeah. you know than. I mean, obviously, the surgery alone doesn't normally have enough long lasting impact for patients right. and the medical treatments can for a lot of people have lasting impact, but, uh, there are patients where combining those two, it just is a, a beneficial thing to do. Right. I mean, it, it were, the two together has been very successful, the two together, mm -hmm. but just having the surgery alone and going off medication, not, right. not that didn't answer. work out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's interesting, Dr. Cooper, that you say getting to the root cause of these things is so important. Because when I first came to you, when when I would eat, um, 
I would have a spike in insulin, and then my blood sugar would crash, and I would be tired and hungry even after I ate. So if you just look at that alone, it would be like, oh, you're addicted to food. Well, no, it wasn't. I was, I had metabolic dysfunction. What was happening in me that caused that blood sugar crash and to be tired and hungry right after I ate? Right, because you have that, it's called postprandial hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia. <laughs> so, whoa, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> it's where when you eat, even just putting food in your mouth triggers an insulin response. So hmm. we're not talking about high insulin levels that happen, you know, after you're digesting, we're talking about an abnormal release of insulin that's too strong, too fast. And that tends to uh, run in families and it's connected to risk for diabetes. And um, mm -hmm. so it's, it's a very common thing. Often it starts in childhood. So, and this often is confused with people who think that that happens only if you eat a candy bar or something like super high sugar, and they think that that's going to make your glucose go too high, which makes your insulin go too high, which then pulls the glucose into your tissues and bottoms out your blood level. That's not what we're talking about. This can happen with eating a completely normal, very innocent meal or snack, um, something even small, something even that doesn't have a lot of carbohydrates. It's just the act of putting food in your mouth where the enzymes that inform your pancreas that you're eating, they turn on and it's supposed to be sort of a priming that happens with the pancreas. So it gets ready to release this insulin to match the glucose that's coming into the bloodstream from the food that you're digesting, which will be like 90 minutes later, <laughs> but instead mm. the insulin just can immediately turn on. It's actually like there are electrical switches in the body that actually turn the stuff on that uh, have to do with potassium and ions and stuff like that. But, um, <laughs> but in any case, mm. it's a, it's a rough problem. It's something that I started noticing in my practice so many years ago, and it really alarmed me because um, it can make people quite dysfunctional. You know, you can imagine if after you eat your blood sugar crashes, I mean, the first thing you want is to eat sugar. And it's usually like yeah, an hour right. after you eat that it happens and you can crave sugar and probably you yeah. should eat the sugar <laughs> because if you measure the blood, I mean, that glucose level could be really bottoming out and you need to get it back up. Um, yeah. so that would be a normal physiologic reason for craving that sugar. And it could be misinterpreted as like a sugar addiction. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. That's so interesting. I do remember after meals, I would be, wow, I feel like something sweet right now. And that just was, was, was constant. Mm -hmm. Um, wow, this is super, super interesting. I think one other thing that is contributing to maybe our dysfunction with food in this country is if you look at the commercials that we are bombarded with every day. It's sugary, fatty, salty, horrible food. So we're primed as a culture to want to go reward ourselves with this, you know, sweet dessert or this juicy, greasy hamburger or fries that are loaded with all this stuff. Dr. Cooper, what if somebody is interested in just kind of turning over a, a new leaf when it comes to snacking? It really seems like that starts when we go to the grocery store. What are some great ideas that we can maybe transform our ideas of what a healthy snack life would look like in, in, in a normal diet? Yeah, I mean, I think the main thing is to focus on what we always call in medicine, it's called ordered eating. So most people are on this disordered eating spectrum where they're just haphazard about it or they're doing one little fad thing after another. They may not have an eating disorder, but they're not in a normal eating pattern. And so there's some a tool that we use in people who've had like full-blown eating disorders to get them back to rehab their system back to normal. And it's called ordered eating. And it's actually good mm. for everyone. But what it means is eating on a schedule, eating all the food groups, eating at regular time intervals so that you, there's certain order to it. So first off, you want to get into that. And then you could start thinking about, okay, what am I eating at those intervals? And um, 
there's the snacks and things like that, that we have to put in there are meant to carry you over from between the meals to keep your energy levels up. So ideal would be to combine some form of carbohydrate with maybe protein or fat. And, you know, I don't like to give people specific nutrition advice because again, their own body is telling them what it needs. Um, So we don't want to get in the way of that, but we do try to encourage people to avoid chemical additives in the food supply because those chemicals that are in there, they can affect your metabolism negatively. They can affect your health negatively. So just real food that is within those parameters. It could be something so simple, you know, like dried fruit and nuts or some kind of a granola bar or fruit and peanut butter or fruit and cheese Hmm. or crackers and cheese or chips and salsa or chips and guacamole. I mean, I don't know. It's like, we don't like to give a lot of direction on what to eat other than those basic instructions. And there's a reason for it. It's because we trust people's body and trust a person to develop their own intuition of what makes them feel good. And everyone's so different. Um, So, you know, I think gravitating away from a lot of these like high ingredient list, artificial ingredients, foods that are like heavily marketed and back to like just real food that you recognize and that sounds good, that makes you feel good. Right. I think you always said, what you said to me was the easiest thing to do. It's as close to how it started. That's what you should eat. Like as close to how it was grown, as close to how it was made, as close to how it came out. Yeah, and I'm not even so picky. If you think of it like that, right? It, it it's kind. It makes it kind of easy, and you just think protein, carb, yeah, and fat, right? And then you just pick from those categories. Yeah, and um, you you kind of like I I don't know. You kind of just figure it out, and you don't want to beat yourself up if the other th- no, because some days you may think sugary, and sometimes you may think salty. You need it, and it's you probably need it. You, you kind of figure it out. Yeah, and it's. Also, convenience. Less pressure. It really is less pressure that yeah. way. Yeah. Well, convenience is important too. So we don't want to make your you go through some elaborate meal prep process every time you're about to eat something, because otherwise, by the end of the day, you will have missed. Then you're in panic mode. Yeah. You're in panic <laughs> mode. Like, oh my god, where are my nuts? Where is my this? <laughs> where is my that? Oh my god. Oh my god. You know, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it's like. W- you're fine if you just have one little thing. If you're hungry, eat it. If you're not, goodbye. Especially if you're trying to eat four <laughs> to six times a day and you've got to do it's too hard. that many times of pressure. I, I think prepping ahead, food ahead is a great thing to do. Things that you, like your staples, right. just have those available. But again, we don't like to get too prescriptive with the food. It's just more, that's why I keep it simple. It's like eating at these intervals and eating these food groups, but within those parameters, try to avoid the food additives and, you know, the chemicals and the food supply. And within that, make your choices and combine, you know, both what tastes good, what's convenient. The other thing is don't expect so much from your food because food is fuel. So it's not always going to be like the best meal or the, or like the most tasty <laughs> thing that you ever had. It's just... And it doesn't all have to go on an Instagram shot. Please don't put it all on there. Please. We don't need to see every damn snack you eat. Don't show me. But Here's my kale smoothie. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. but, but this is the beginning of understanding normal ordered eating. And if you're doing that and you still feel like you have those symptoms of, quote, food addiction or binge disorder, there's a metabolic cause of it. So most likely, so try to get to the bottom of what the actual physiologic cause is instead of trying to deal with it as like a addiction, emotional, um, psychological issue, because you could be really missing something that has even wider ranging health consequences potentially. So that's, that's what I encourage, but first start by the, if you're not already doing an ordered eating plan, do that. And if that resolves the symptoms of the, you know, irregular appetite or irregular eating patterns, 
then it probably was just because you really weren't on a good track with your nutrition consistency. But if not, yeah. a medical evaluation is important and really pushing for an evaluation of your metabolism if possible. Boy, that sounds like such good advice because I think a lot of people, they'll be like, oh, I had such a busy morning. I didn't eat anything until lunch. And then it kind of whacks out your your appetite for, for the whole rest of the day. And I think the other thing too, Dr. Cooper, what, what you encourage all of us is just be good to yourself and take the judgment out of it. And if, you, if you're having trouble controlling stuff, it's not like a, a lack of willpower. It could be a, a serious medical issue that's going on inside your body. So just be good to yourself and, and go get some help if something isn't doesn't feel right. Exactly. Right. Well, this has been super interesting once again. Dr. Emily Cooper, Andrea Taylor, we uh, talked about food addiction, fact or fiction. Thanks so much. Another edition of Fat Science. No diets, no agendas, just science that makes you feel better. I'm Mark Wright. Thanks for listening to Fat Science with Dr. Emily Cooper, a work P2P production. New episodes drop every Monday. If you've enjoyed the conversation, subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. This production is for informational purposes only and is not intended to replace professional medical advice. Join us next week for another episode dedicated to the science of why we get fat. No diets, no agendas, just science that makes you feel better.